Great. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special event on artificial intelligence and healthcare. Uh, my name is Benjamin, and I am the CEO of Swissnext in uh, Boston and New York. Uh, Swissnext was created here in Boston uh, in year 2000, so a little bit more than 20 years ago, as the world's very first uh, science consulate, which uh, really led the foundation for what became uh, the global Swissnext network. Uh, today, our team on the East Coast uh, is split uh, between our original location in uh, Greater Boston in Cambridge and our new offices in uh, Soho in New York City. Uh, we also work very closely with the four other Swissnext locations uh, worldwide, uh, which are San Francisco, China, Brazil, uh, India, as well as uh, with science and technology offices and counselors based in about 20 Swiss embassies uh, around the world. So we are a truly global network, so to say. Uh, Today's event stems from our collaboration with our long-standing long partner, uh, the Board of Higher Education of the Canton de Vaud, uh, one of the 26 uh, cantons uh, that form the Swiss Confederation, and it happens to be the one uh, I'm from. Uh, as part of this collaboration, we work with some of the higher ed institutions uh, based in the canton, uh, including our co-host today, which is uh, the ESAV School of Health Sciences in Lausanne. We are very pleased uh, to work with them again. Uh, ESAV has long-standing ties to the greater Boston area, uh, in particular, but not only uh, with Northeastern University and Boston College. Uh, in the past, uh, Swiss Next Boston has had the pleasure of working intensively uh, with their physical therapy and nursing programs around some visits to Boston. Uh, but as travel isn't possible right now, we have decided uh, to partner on a series of virtual events uh, whose idea is really to bring insights and inspiration from the frontiers of healthcare as we see them here in Boston back to Switzerland. Today is the first event of the series, and it's about the nexus of artificial intelligence uh, in uh, health and healthcare, as I, as I said before. And to me, it seems that it's really happening at a, at a very interesting moment for this particular interface. Uh, there has been a lot of innovation in the past years, uh, especially since the pandemic started. Uh, for one thing, machine learning is, uh, is really kind of turbocharging uh, biomedical research right now. Uh, bio biology more broadly is experiencing its own AI moment uh, with an explosion of, of papers involving AI methods. Uh, and in this context, uh, we are very grateful uh, that our two speakers uh, from the Jamil Clinic at MIT are taking the time to present and inspire uh, all of us with their amazing work uh, today. Uh, the Jamil Clinic, or J Clinic as it's called, uh, was established at MIT in 2018 and is the newest member of the Jamil family of programs uh, at MIT. Uh, that includes the Jamil Poverty Action Lab. Uh, by the way, its founders were awarded the 2019 uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, but also the Jamil uh, World Water and Food Systems Lab uh, and the Jamil World Education Lab. Uh, and the goal of the J Clinic uh, is precisely to develop AI technologies uh, that will change the landscape of healthcare. Uh, so we, before we hear from our two speakers, I will let my Swiss Next colleague, Johanna, briefly introduce them, and she will also be moderating the event today. Again, a very big thank you to the Canton de Vaux, ESAV, uh, Jamil Clinic, uh, as well as the rest of you for attending, and I wish you all a great event. All right, thank you very much, Benjamin, and uh, thank you also to everyone who has joined us here today. My name is Johanna Lemon, and I am the Events and Operations Manager here at Swiss Next Boston, and I will be your guide to today's discussion. I would like to introduce you briefly to our two speakers. Uh, gentlemen, if you could join me on stage for a moment. Hello, welcome. Uh, so we will be speaking with Adam Yala and Ignacio Fuentes Ribas, uh, both of whom are denizens of the MIT universe. Uh, but we are actually going to be starting our conversation with Adam, uh, in part because the life of a PhD candidate at MIT is uh, nonstop. So he will need to leave us just a bit early, but he's here now and we are so grateful to have him. Uh, that being said, we will be taking questions for Adam directly after his talk. So please, if you have anything uh, for him during his presentation, feel free to add them to the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, just reiterate the Q&A function, not the chat box. Um, afterward, we will have Ignacio's presentation uh, and his own Q&A session. So um, Ignacio, we will see you later. And uh, without further ado, let me introduce Adam Yala. Uh, one moment. So Adam is a PhD candidate at MIT, where he focuses on creating algorithms that can deliver more precise and equitable healthcare to all. Specifically, he works in developing neural models that can help predict a person's future healthcare risks. 
Within the field of oncology, he's passionate about creating algorithms that to do two very crucial things, improve early detection of cancer and reduce overtreatment. And as a matter of fact, Massachusetts General Hospital has already implemented one of his algorithms clinically. Uh, they're using his algorithmic technology to help interpret the data behind thousands of mammograms, thus aiding in the early detection of breast cancer. Uh, Adam, take it away. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Let me start by sharing my slides. Okay, I hope everyone can see this okay. Uh, all right, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, our work at MIT and what we think AI can do for early detection. So what we want to do is improve uh, cancer survival and as a motivating example, it's like a breast cancer survival. If you want to improve uh, breast cancer survival, there's one of two things we can do. Uh, we can either improve survival for patients with only metastatic disease. So this is, you know, stage distance uh, and it can invent better drugs. Uh, but another path forward is just catching cancer systematically more early. So every time we have a patient with poor prognosis, one of the questions you can ask ourselves is, well, how would we have known to have caught this earlier? And if we truly had great system to early detection, we could improve the survival to 99%. So to improve early detection, then there's kind of two problems we need to solve. One of them is, well, when someone is still healthy and is still at year zero, how can we predict who's going to develop breast cancer soon? And the second problem is, given some level of disinformation, how do we reimagine our guidelines to dynamically determine who should get screened next, and kind of balance our screening potential for, you know, to give it the resources those who need it most and reduce over screening for those who don't need it. So these are kind of two flip sides of the coin. I'm gonna talk about each of them in turn. And this first problem, namely how to predict breast cancer risk is really the focus of a recent time trust estimation paper that came out this January. So uh, to give a little background and context, uh, you know, we did not invent the problem of risk modeling. People have worked on this since at least like the late uh, 1970s, I believe. And in classical risk models, you have uh, simple demographic factors like someone's age, whether or not they have any family history of the disease, if they have any prior breast biopsies. And these metrics are combined together to give you an overall score how likely you are to develop cancer. And the way that these scores are normally evaluated is via something called AUC. So for those that are not familiar, uh, it's a kind of a probability ranking metric where 0.5 is uh, random, 1.0 is perfect. Uh, and 0 0.6 is really quite moderate, uh, modest, uh, accuracy is really not quite strong. Uh, for a very long time, people have thought, well, maybe there's much more to a woman's risk of cancer than just her age and her family history. Maybe there is something about the breast itself and something you can see on x-ray that informs us of their likelihood of risk. This idea was first kind of popularized in the late 60s and has been you know, part of a much larger movement in the United States. And it's actually recently hit federal legislation uh, as, as I think in 2020. Uh, and now there has been classical risk models have all been updated to incorporate these scores, but we see that this notion of using breast density is not strong enough and only improves our risk accuracy from 61 to 63. So what we looked at in this work was, well, what if instead of kind of manually designing how we think about a mammogram, and instead of like manually picking out the biomarker by eye, what if we treat this as an optimization problem and instead use the most powerful techniques we can and produce algorithmic innovations to learn how to predict risk directly from a full resolution mammogram. And in this comparison, I'm going to be showing you four different models. Uh, one's a tired acoustic model. It's kind of the current clinical state-of-the-art model. It's widely utilized. It has like 60 questions about like hormone replacement therapy, age, detailed family history. Uh, Resna is kind of a straightforward, off-the-box uh, image and pre-trained model. ImageDL is a paper of ours from a little over a year ago with kind of a standard backbone, but a uh, more careful optimization setup. And Mirai is our newest work, which introduces a few different uh, technical innovations. And so to kind of show you this as kind of how they lead to each other, I want to emphasize that all of these models I'm going to show you on the deep learning side are all trained on the same data set. And so the difference between the numbers that you see is really only attributed to modeling gain. Uh, and I'll briefly talk about the different pieces of Mirai uh, in a short, in short time. Okay, so let's just hop straight into the numbers, and then we'll kind of step back. Uh, we see that on the MGH test sets, this is about 26,000 held out exams uh, from held out patients. Uh, the Tarkusic model gets a C index or it's equivalent to generalized AUC of 63. So it's really in the same ballpark as we see for the rest of the community. When we take a simple ResNet without any modifications, we get a very similar number. And we see that our newest model, Mirai gets a 77 points compared to the original 63. So this is a very large uh, 14 points improvement. 
Now let's kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, why does this model improve so much over kind of 73 and 62 baseline? What are some of the technical ideas that make this idea work? So uh, this is a brief kind of schematic description of Mira and there's really three different technical ideas that come together to separate it from the older work. Uh, so the first of which is the way we model uh, risk of disease over time. Uh, broadly, you know, the, there's a couple of ways people have thought about predicting risk in the future. One way is you say cancer within five years, yes or no, and you treat it as a simple classification task. The trouble with that approach is that if you have four year risk or three year risk, you're training separate models for each one and it doesn't leverage the relationship between these time points. Another path is you say, okay, well, let's, let's, pr let's predict risk as proportional hazards, but then the risk at all time points is the same. And this also has limitations. So the way we approach it in this work is that we introduce a, what we call a cumulative hazard layer and additive hazard layer. And we basically build our best five-year prediction using our best four-year prediction. And we build the best four-year prediction given the three-year prediction. So we introduce a way to model all time points at the same time to both predict risk better, but also better use the data set available. Another idea that we introduced is uh, a way to use risk factors and this kind of traditional clinical information only if we have it. So in prior work, what we had is like, okay, you have some risk factors, you have a model, you just use them both as inputs and make the prediction. But our ability to collect these risk factors very much depends on the institutional setting. And so instead what we do now is we say, let's actually take the mammogram and predict all the risk factors. Let's predict a woman's age and her weight and her uh, menopause status from the mammogram. And then if the information is not available to us at test time, we can just use this predicted version to drive our prediction. And the last component was uh, introducing a way to remove biases from the training data. One of the things that we found was that if with vanilla training techniques, our model, when just trained to predict risk, it learns to behave differently depending on the clinical environment and produce different kinds of risk scores you can see on the left-hand side, depending on the machine the mammogram was taken. And so to fight against this bias, we use conditional adversarial training and we were able to fully eliminate it. So kind of these different steps together got us the overall improvements to an AUC of 77. Now, beyond showing performance in one sensor, it was very important for us that this actually worked broadly because what we care about is not just improving risk in one place, maybe it's a fluke, but really showing that this can offer a broad improvement to a wider set of patients. So in the original paper, we have had finished our validation with Carl Linska and CGMH. We've recently finished validating with Emory and there's a, many more in the pipeline to really make sure as part of you know, responsive model development, the model truly scales and works well. So uh, this is the uh, numbers of the external validations in Karolinska and CGMH. And you see that the model uh, actually gets slightly higher performance in Karolinska and CGMH and continues to improve over our other deep learning baselines. And actually on the right-hand side, we couldn't run tire QSIC on these other data sets because they don't collect this kind of detailed risk factor information everywhere. It's actually quite uncommon. And uh, the models on the right use only the image information, impute and predict out the missing risk factor information. This broad generalization is supported by kind of our detailed subgroup analysis. And on the MGH test set, we saw that the model performed reasonably well across races and age groups uh, and different slicings of the data set. So what does this mean clinically? And why does this number, uh, why does improved number matter? Well, on one comparison, we saw that uh, if you compare it to existing clinical guidelines that use risk numbers, like who does get screening MRI, given the same screening budget, you can only do two times better uh, using a better risk model. Uh, this kind of discriminative performance, but also our detailed validation helps motivate our collaborators at MGH to actually use this model during the pandemic. Uh, especially through the kind of early phases of the lockdowns in March, there was a much reduced screening volume uh, through MGH and many of the other local hospitals. And so this reduces the delays in diagnosis. So a critical step in the minimizing the harms of the pandemic and kind of improving early detection, if you have a limited screening capacity, is to prioritize who you're inviting by risk. And this is exactly what our collaborators are doing. Okay, so as I said before, there's kind of two pieces to this puzzle, right? The first one is, can we predict risk better? And we showed that given some uh, different algorithmic ideas, we can continue to improve this number. And for simple guidelines like who gets MRI, it's clear how we can achieve an improvement. But there's actually, an even bigger opportunity to rethink the way we think about screening guidelines in the first place, given these better risk models. Intuitively, if you have a really good risk model, you're able to say, this person's a high risk, maybe they should get screened every six months, this person's a very low risk, maybe they can get screened every three years, and really get personalized screening to best fit the patient's needs. So uh, we need techniques to enable us to do this. And the basic idea of how we're gonna do this, we can actually treat this itself as a learning problem. And instead of designing our screening guidelines by saying, 
everyone gets everything every year, everyone gets everything every two years, we can learn the policy as an optimization problem. So, okay, how do we do that and what does that mean? Well, we need two things in order to treat this as a learning problem. We need a simulation environment and we need a scoring function to rank policies. And I'm gonna claim that actually the retrospective longitudinal data that we already collect is a great resource for both of those things. So this is a simple pictorial sketch of someone that got screened every year in hindsight uh, from year zero to year three and got diagnosed in year three. Given this information, we can actually model out, well, in hindsight, what could have been better screening policies for this person to have followed? We can see that if they got screened every six months, this would have, uh, this maybe could have helped them between years two and three, but it was also much higher screening costs and higher risk of false positives. Uh, so the basic idea is that, you know, we can easily count screening costs by just looking at the number of black dots and we can create models of early detection benefits and delay based on the timing of when the, pa when the patient was diagnosed and the properties of the cancer. So here we're going to show some very simple ones. If we recommend you to get screened after diagnosis, we'll call that negative and a delay. We say it's within some period before your diagnosis, we can say this can offer acceleration. And we can simulate these policies where each time we have a risk assessment and learn to control it using reinforcement learning. So to show some very preliminary results on this, we showed that if you look at annual screening, you can get an average like two month early detection benefit on the early on the MGH test set. Uh, but if you do risk-based screening with a learned policy, you can use uh, 0.95 mammograms per year and get plus five months. But really there's many possible trade-offs, right? What is the right amount of screening uh, budget for the population as a whole? This is not something for kind of me to decide as independent you know, computer scientists. Uh, and there's many possible metrics, right? Here I showed some very, some very simplistic about months early detection. We might want to use quality dose of life years or specifically different metrics depending on the type of cancer that will be diagnosed. And so the technical idea here is that we can actually leave this as all part of the clinical decision process and not part of the technical uh, design process. So what we do is actually we train our model using multi-objective reinforcement learning to support all different combinations of the rewards at the same time. So we have this kind of like pre to optimal conduct hull and at test time, all these have to do is say, okay, well, what is my preference between screening volume and these different kinds of early detection rewards and give me the best policy for that preference. So this is a pictorial representation of just that on the uh, MGH uh, test set and I'll show you any other test sets in a second. So you see here in the blue dots, Tempo is the name of the RL framework. And you can see that up and to the right, you're getting for less mammograms as the X axis, you're getting higher early detection. If you use a worst worst model like Tyre Cusick, which is one we talked about before, you see that you don't get, you can still beat the green dots, which is the kind of existing guidelines like annual and biannual screening, uh, but you don't get quite as far as the blue dots. So this tells us a couple of things. One, as we continue to improve risk models, we expect to do this better and better as it's easier to rethink and kind of design these new, more optimal screening policies. Uh, and as we get better at estimating, well, what would have happened if I screened a year earlier, have better cancer growth models, we're able to do this better as well. Now, these policies that are all trained at MGH, given the similar kind of setting, uh, we found that they generalized uh, as before to Karolinska and uh, CGMH. And really what it shows us is that it's, it's it, the performance and generalization of this is really built on the backbone of us being able to build better and better risk models. Uh, okay, so, so far I've kind of showed you uh, in breast cancer, how you can build better risk models and how given these better risk models, we can think about how to design better screening policies to give us that actual early detection benefit that we want. Uh, this is not a breast cancer specific picture. And this is true for many of the cancers out there. For example, a lung cancer, the numbers are all different, but we could greatly improve lung cancer survival if we had every single lung cancer caught at an early stage. So this motivates the same kind of problem, uh, but the modalities are a bit different. Uh, we, we still want to improve risk assessments so you can better understand who to screen, uh, when to screen them, and uh, how to better design our policies. So the background here is also similar to how things were prior, previously approached in breast cancer, except now instead of using family history, people look at really smoking history to derive their models. And in prior validations, people have seen that these models can get a six year AUC of about 0.65. So this has motivated other work in the group uh, to say, okay, well, how well can we, given the, the reasonable modality for lung cancer, in this case, it's low dose CT, how can you predict six year risk? Uh, and without going into too much depth of the technical details, we saw that for a new architecture we've been working on, we can only get a, a seven point here improvement in six year AC on the endless test set. Uh, meaning to say that this is really more broader vision and that we can, the same way we can build gains of breast cancer, we can replicate this kind of progress across more and more disease areas. So if we take a step back for a bit and look at the broader landscape of what we're doing and the landscape of AI methods in healthcare, 
there's a lot of work in automating tasks that humans can do, like how we make a diagnosis more efficient or how do we uh, automate text extraction, these kind of things. And these are all very important. But there's also a lot of work in automating tasks that humans cannot do. So by human eye, when we look at a mammogram, we're very bad at predicting future risk. And when we look at someone's risk, we're very bad at thinking about, okay, what should be their next follow-up interval given this sequence of numbers in front of my eyes? And automating these tasks that humans cannot do is where a lot of the value lies. And even most of the things that we care about, including predicting recurrences, sensitivity to treatments, uh, drug combinations, are all in this kind of bucket of prediction tasks that are beyond our capacity. And so as we look at these kind of tasks, there's kind of common challenges and common takeaways we can use for all of them. So in general, we tend to be learning from outcomes. And so when we do that, there's kind of several questions like how do you define these outcomes and what are the possible pitfalls in doing so? And how do we ensure that these models actually generalize and give us good performance? So we think about defining outcomes, you know, in, in the uh, Mirai work you showed here that like, we just looked at was cancer diagnosed, yes or no, by pathology. But there's many more refined outcomes we could use, right? We could say, well, was it invasive cancer? Was it invasive cancer beyond a certain size or was it lethal? Uh, and in general, to define these outcomes, there's a balance between, well, how clinically meaningful is this outcome? And what's the data set size? And how difficult it is to annotate these outcomes and get it for cohorts at large quantities? And actually getting this right can be quite nuanced and subtle because uh, you always want to make sure that what you're modeling is what you want, but like sometimes the outcomes you might choose might actually perpetuate existing biases. So this is an example that was uh, shown a couple of years ago in science uh, by Obermeier al. showing that one of the commonly used uh, algorithms by insurance companies uh, to figure out who is likely to need more care uh, actually models care by picking the wrong outcome. It figured out who's likely to require more costs. And because of existing disparities in the healthcare system, this propagated a much worse set of features for African-American patients than Caucasian patients who had a different cost averages across the entire data set. And so sometimes the choice outcome isn't just about clinical meaningful, but it's also about what is the correct data generating process and which of these outcomes does not actually capture existing biases. Because that's one piece of the puzzle, how the outcomes so that are model learning the right thing and doesn't capture existing biases. The next step is, okay, once you have an, a correct set outcome and we have good performance in our test set, like in our case, we use the MGH test set for a lot of our model development. How do we make sure these models actually generalize to the broader population and don't just uh, give poor performance for uh, other, other populations? There's been a lot of concern about this in broadly in the scientific community and also in the press, and I think rightfully so, uh, in that if you have AI systems that unknowingly capture disparities in how they're trained, uh, they can invisibly uh, perpetuate them. And if the model's trained using primarily uh, men, it might more perform worse on women. And there's many versions of this uh, problem. If you look at this from kind of a machine learning, learning theory perspective, it really comes down to a problem of distributional shift from training. So if we train at training time, if everyone comes from a certain distribution, uh, and you see here, I've picked toilet shown in blue, and at test time, we move to a different hospital, a different set of patients, and it's, the population is very different and has different kinds of features, our estimated performance has no reason to hold up. And now when we think about what does it mean to have distributional shift, it's not just a thing of like, oh, it's only demographics. It can mean, it can be very, a wide set of possible covariates, right? It can be demographics, it could be clinical settings or machines that were used in the process. And so there's really a lot of attributes to test here to make sure what we're doing actually works. Uh, and this problem of there being bias in what we're learning is not really a new machine learning problem. It's a, real, a much older problem of, uh, of our modeling, right? So like the Thai physics model, which is a much older model, has shown disparate performance across different uh, demographics. Now, in our recent paper, we showed that the MGH, that's so diverse enough to avoid a lot of this problem from the get-go. But sometimes in our case, or from the case of training against uh, the vice invariants with different machines, you have to actually mitigate this issue via specific learning algorithms. Uh, what this motivates kind of brought together is really a need for new standards to enable responsible model development. You know, there's recent work and uh, I had a lot of attention recently, uh, early last year, about a new AI system, also for breast cancer screening, uh, that tested on US and UK cohorts. But in that setting, there was no subgroup analysis provided, and there was no way to tell from the writing itself that it had disparate performance across different groups, either by demographic or by machine. And doing those kind of understanding is really critical to understand will a model work when the, when the mixing ratio of these distributions is very different. So in one set, the easy case where we know the kind of bias that can exist uh, and we can test for it and work to fix it. 
uh, sometimes we don't know what kind of bias uh, the model can be learning. We don't know uh, why weird behavior is happening. Uh, there's been cases in which there was weird bias in the data and they made my model learn arbitrarily high accuracy. There's been many cases where people train chest, map, chest x-ray machines uh, given different institutions and the model just learns which institution the thing came from. And so to really be rigorous and about the way we develop these models, not only about testing biases that we think might exist, but also doing a lot of external validation analyses to make sure the model actually generalizes the more broad setting. So kind of in summary, kind of closing out the talk, uh, most of the value I believe in what AI can do for healthcare is an ottoman that task humans cannot do. And in doing this, we have both an opportunity to kind of reinvent how things work today and come up with novel algorithmic solutions to kind of give us the best benefits, for example, in risk assessment and personalized screening. But as we do so, because we're because these things are hard to validate by eye, because humans cannot do them, we need to be really careful about how we build these things. The outcome definition is critical. We need to test for possible biases and work to resolve them and really commit to a much broader set of external validation uh, to test for unknown possible sources of bias. And so with that, I want to thank all my lovely collaborators and uh, my advisor, Regina, uh, for making this work possible. And I'm excited to take your questions and to discuss. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Adam. That was incredibly fascinating. Um, so we do have some questions that we took uh, from the event registration that we will be happy to share. And also please keep in mind, uh, any attendees can uh, add questions to the Q&A box, uh, which will be curated and we can answer uh, live. So we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so something that I think we're all curious about uh, and was one of the questions from the registration was, are your algorithms for breast cancer applicable or adaptable to other types of cancer? If not, how singular to breast cancer is your technology? So many of the components are really, uh, for example, we're also now working on lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. Uh, a lot of the components that we use for breast cancer are uh, reused. But with every new modality, there's kind of new nuggets and pieces of structure in the signal that you can use to devise better algorithms. Uh, so the, the best uh, lung model we have today has more technical ideas to make it fit for CT scans. It's a much more complex modality than a model for mammography. And so while the general direction and the general style of training is fairly consistent, uh, with every new project, there's new opportunities to innovate. So that's kind of specific to the cancer. And so I expect we'll see that while the kind of state of the art will be more and more similar as all the different directions improve, it won't be exactly the same model. Okay. Uh, and now a question that kind of skirts the field of medical ethics. Uh, what are some of the boundaries of liability or uh, when an algorithm like yours is employed? Um, or in other words, uh, how does the liability or the idea of liability impact your research? So I view this in part as like, how do we design the use case of how the model is supposed to be used? Because that really impacts liability and how we think about it. So uh, one way right now the models used today at MGH is that all the information is available to the radiologists uh, as in real time as they do screening. And given that information, they have the ability to decide, okay, well, uh, what, how do I want to communicate this? And what do I want to do with this information? The way it was used early in the pandemic is about how do we invite, prioritize people accordingly. And so it's not really a, a new AI specific question of what does liability mean? Uh, it's, well, you have the radiologists making clinical decisions given some information sources, uh, how do they use those tools and how do you validate that? Uh, for many systems, we already have uh, FDA regulations that govern them. Uh, and so it's, uh, in general, the kind of the roadmap is the same as it has been for all prior medical technologies. We need to test them rigorously. We, we need to do like prospective trials before saying this is a particular threshold and use case how you should use it. And we build confidence by building incremental successes. Uh, and I think that's kind of the path forward for any of these things. Uh, let me see. So could you tell us more about in a general sense, maybe using uh, the example of the clinical application here in Boston, how would such a technology be applied in a hospital um, from when it's accepted slash acquired to the diagnostic from the doc uh, diagnostic to doctor? Yeah, so uh, one use case we talk a lot about in the paper uh, is in flagging people for high risk screening. So right now there's existing clinical guideline that looks at if your lifetime risk is over 20% by the Tarkusic model or these other models, uh, the patient is eligible for MRI screening and it's reimbursed by local insurances and it's part of like kind of 
it's part of normal screening here. Uh, you can use the model as a plug and play replacement for that exactly. So instead of using this threshold, you just use one based off the IS score. And what we expect to see is that the amount of cancers you'd catch via MRI will be 2x more than before. And so in some cases, you can just plug and play existing guidelines, but if you have a better tool for it, uh, we should be able to get better performance. And that would be the kind of workflow, except now just you click a different button to get your risk score. Uh, in other cases, because the model can do more things, is a bit more flexible than before, there's a lot of chance to like invent new kind of workflows. And in doing so, when, we, when we're messing with workflows, there's kind of like also a harder path to validate them, right? So like one of the things that I, I, our collaborator Connie's thought a lot about is how do we triage and kind of organize screening uh, given risk scores? Because right now, oftentimes people are read randomly uh, throughout the day, you know, first come, first serve, who gets the mammogram read? Uh, if you batch them, say, okay, he's a high risk patient, a low risk patient, can people read more efficiently? Can you say the really low risk people don't need to be read uh, maybe even at all because they're so low risk and the probability is near zero? So, like these triage style workflows. But as we do this, the, there's a big design space of what we can do, uh, but it's going to take a lot of clinical study and prospective clinical proving to, to make stick. Gotcha. And it looks like we have a question from the audience. So kind of following off that, are you planning on, on implementing this in Switzerland? Um, and if no, why not? Uh, we would love to have a partner in Switzerland to work with. <laughs> uh, and so uh, if the asker of the question can help make that happen, we would love to. <laughs> 100%. Um, and then how about another one from the audience? Uh, how does your work change the way radiologists or radiographers work? So for the most part, the, the task risk assessment is really something we already rely on for computational tools to do. So we, we can, there's work we can say, like we can change how screening is done exactly and kind of change the radiology workflow. But I think the large opportunity is when someone, you finish screening someone and you say, this is not cancer today. We're not gonna go put you some treatment pathway, uh, go home. What do we tell them next is kind of the key question opportunity. Are they healthy today, but a high risk within a year or should they come back in two years or three years? How do we balance their kind of longitudinal management is where I think we can play a big role. And so it's a part that's currently kind of, uh, where there's where the guidelines are really simplistic because we, or we have like national guidelines of like everyone gets annual, everyone gets biannual. So we don't put a lot of thought into it quite yet. But if we have more sophisticated tools, you have a really a bigger opportunity to do better. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and how about, uh, I think that maybe some clarification on one point um, an audience member asked. So with a very low risk score, the mammogram uh, that was just taken might not be read. Can you clarify that? Uh, one of the possible work uh, workflows that one of our club has been exploring is a triage workflow. So if you're in a really resource limited setting, and you have one clinic to, that can't afford to screen everyone at the same time, uh, you can use this to prioritize. You can say, okay, well, if radiologists can read five mammograms, they can read eight if they only read their high risk ones because the ones that are really low risk can be read automatically. Right now, this is not a workflow that's uh, actually, as far as, I, as far as I know, being done uh, anywhere. But someone's being studied as a way to reduce cost by, for people that are like zero probability uh, risk and there's ways to validate this, uh, then given, given that, those can be automated and read via just the machine and the ones that are higher risk, that you can kind of space, turn resources in that direction. Interesting. And actually, um, so something pretty targeted from the audience, uh, which I think is quite uh, an interesting question due to how, like for example, medicine is being changed in the, in the uh, wake of the pandemic. Do you think it could be possible to implement something similar in the home care medical field? Uh, I so in breast, I think it would be a bit challenging because it's quite uncommon to have like uh, a portable mammogram machine in most homes. Now there is there's been work in like uh, screening accessibility where there's kind of like trucks that go around with access to these machines to kind of like offer screening. And so, given someone has a mammogram, there's no reason why they can't get the risk assessment themselves and have access to this kind of uh, kind of follow up guideline recommendations. Uh, but I think in where, when we develop technology based on kind of like richer signals, uh, where those rich signals like a CT scan or MRI is not available through kind of like an at-home diagnostic test kit, then this thing's a little farther away to bring into an at-home setting. Uh, and when people develop things more based off blood or you have an easier time to kind of mail something in and get it back, then there there's kind of a big opportunity for at-home. 
sure. Gotcha. And it looks like I think we've got time for one more question. So I'll go ahead and say, uh, your work uh, uses visual images. Could the input also be clinical functional data? For example, declining cognition and autonomy before the diagnosis of Alzheimer's based on large data sets and longitudinal data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually one of the projects we've been working on with collaborators in University of Copenhagen is looking at uh, medical codes longitudinally for decades to predict pancreatic cancer. And so the, uh, the ideas of the technology are really agnostic to the source modality but in general, the richer, the better, and the more kind, uh, the more canonical, the better. So let's say you're modeling off clinical notes. Uh, that's a little bit trickier, not because we can't model text. We can, it's just that like, there's more differences in text from center to center than there are in images. An x-ray looks like an x-ray, more or less. But if people write about, if the way people describe cognition decline is systematically different each time, or if the way that they're recorded is different from center to center, you'll have a harder time generalizing across centers. Uh, but this is definitely a much broader opportunity than vision alone. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah, we're just about 10 minutes. So um, thank you very much, Adam. That was wonderful. And uh, we really look forward to seeing uh, what you do next. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, good luck. Thank you for having me. Yes. All right, and I would like uh, to bring uh, Ignacio to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so Ignacio Fuentes Ribas currently works as the managing director of the Jamil Clinic for Machine Learning in Health at MIT, although he's also held equally esteemable positions at the Generali Group, General Electric, and Santander. In his current role, he's working to develop research around the areas of artificial intelligence, life sciences, and medicine. He's also engaged in the practice of change management or encouraging companies to not only invent life-changing technologies, but to also implement them. Furthermore, Ignacio is actively involved in the health tech and fintech sectors and is a machine learning and blockchain enthusiast. He's also a mentor and has guided uh, many students in their quest to become the next revolutionary startup. Uh, Ignacio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joanna and uh, Benjamin, Jonas, James. <clears throat> all the ones that uh, make this possible today. Um, let me see if I can share my screen as well. And this should be a good one. Let me see. Is it visible more or less? It is, if you could just uh, magnify your screen so that we can see the full presentation. Thank okay. you, that's great. Thank you, Jonah. So first thing, uh, uh, words of appreciation, uh, because this is a very cherished family, the one of uh, Swiss Next, and just to say to the friends uh, in Vo and uh, from SAF and others that uh, you're in very good hands. This, uh, this Swiss Next family, it's, uh, it's an excellent one. They always take care of us and they do it very well. They've been doing it for years and uh, it's always a pleasure being with you guys. So let me explain what we do here at the uh, J Clinic. And uh, I think uh, what Adam was just doing was uh, uh, just a taste, a sample of, of, the, of the business we are, which is kind of like saving lives. And uh, it's amazing. And when you, when you listen to some of those uh, talks and how uh, technology can really make a difference in that space, right? Uh, it's, it's humbling and it's, 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 it's impressive uh, how, we can, how we can change things. So the idea of J Clinic, is working at this intersection of uh, AI and healthcare. So bringing technology to a space where like, uh, it's all a matter of trust, right? And I've seen some of those uh, questions in the, in the Q&A uh, related to uh, how, how should we trust those technologies? I'm gonna try to explain a little bit this in my, in my presentation, but uh, I think uh, we have an opportunity together and it's not just uh, us at the Jamil Clinic because we are empowered to, to do this but uh, I would say that the healthcare community to really make a, a difference by bringing and adopting uh, some of those technologies uh, today. Uh, first thing uh, before starting, I would like to mention because there's been some question about uh, equity, which is always like a, a concerning one when we use those technologies. And we have a very interesting conference uh, coming in one month. It's a free conference. You can all, re all register. And I think uh, it's, it's another way to understand what is happening in that space. We always fear that some of those uh, technological uh, large 
players uh, are what are they doing with our data and what are the things that you know like uh, what are the challenges right when dealing with those uh, big algorithms and large uh, data sets and and i think uh, adam was explaining this very well right there's a good way for us to use technology for good in a in a, in a way that can try to help and eradicate some of those uh, disparities uh, whether it's uh, racial social and 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 the, the ones that we've been uh, experiencing and even more aggravated since the since the pandemic right uh, just a, a brief comment so this is a, a slide that i like it very much i'm not even sure it represents the reality but this is uh, very much like what we aim to accomplish here and it's uh, how uh, ai it's kind of impacting this uh, healthcare ecosystem right and you can see from uh, anything uh, related to managing medical records because all this uh, information how this information is processed right we have uh, internet of things and uh, our uh, devices that uh, mo can monitor uh, permanently but then uh, even if, even jumping to a, a, another dimension talking about like the genomics right and all these huge amounts of data data sets that uh, require these uh, very uh, sophisticated and dedicated um, treatment, right? What kind of models we use for this? And um, relevant today uh, with this conversation, uh, nursing, uh, home care, uh, for the pathology, this is uh, something that is also very relevant. And all of this combined in this uh, simultaneous effort of bringing this uh, information together. Uh, of, of course, anything robotic uh, surgery related, and uh, we use some of these uh, models to train the robots. We don't do this necessarily, but there's people, uh, there's people working on this. And, uh, and what Adam is uh, precisely working on, on breast, lung, pancreatic, and others, on this uh, database clinical judgment, right? Um, there's another space that uh, I'm not going to talk today, but it's uh, very interesting, which is all the drug discovery. This is part of the of the work that we do as well in uh, in J Clinic, and it's it's particularly relevant because uh, what we've seen in the pandemic is that how some of those solutions to implement, you know, like fast uh, and and quick so, uh, um, uh, responses to the to the pandemic. We did a very interesting research uh, one year ago. That's the, the anniversary on the halicin, we call it. And it's the first time a model was able to uh, uh, provide a, a solution on how to deal with some uh, pathogens, right? And uh, we've been doing this since specifically uh, uh, on the pandemic with, uh, with the virus and uh, uh, with very promising results. And this is how uh, many uh, biotech uh, partners are working on that space. And it's amazing the improvements that have been happening in the last, in the last few months. And of course, uh, medical imaging, but uh, and and the online consultation, as we've seen in the in 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 the in the last few months because of the pandemics, and try now to combine this, right? Because uh, in isolation, we can even envision this, right? But try to combine this in a way that you know it could be used in a very multimodal uh, purpose, right? So this is kind of like uh, what we would like to, to to where we would like to be and how we'd like to to get there, right? It's still going to take some time, but. Uh, this is our aspiration, let's say. Okay, let me see if I can show you the next slide. That, that doesn't work. Okay, that does, that's not this one, yes. Just to give you some sense, because not everybody has the same uh, insight on what uh, AI is. And I've seen some questions, what is AI and what is deep learning or what is machine learning, right? And this is a story that starts a few years ago maybe back on the 50s, 60s, there's a group of researchers here at MIT and Brown and other schools that come with this, with this, with this name. And well, there was already like uh, uh, some, 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 some history behind, but this one, the first time we start uh, hearing about the, this idea of AI, right? Machine learning comes a little bit later. We, we have some of those models that are being built and that happens between the 80s and the, and the, and the 2000s. And then starting in 2006, 8, 10, uh, things change completely, especially the moment we get into this, this uh, deep learning, right? Uh, using the deep neural networks. And um, very interesting also uh, to, 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 to make a point here. Uh, I think it's to probably in 2012 when Adam was mentioning that uh, these were uh, humans cannot really compete with those kind of machines, especially in the vision. There's no way. There's no way that that uh, humans can beat those machines, and and machines keep keep increasing and keep uh, keep improving and keeping uh, keep doing it better, right? And uh, if you if if you look at this as a from a technology standpoint as a, as a, as a group, right, you can see the artificial intelligence would be like the large family, right? 
And then we get into a more like a uh, lower level, which would be the machine learning, which is most of the work that we do. And then depending on the different technology we may use, it's artificial neural networks, deep learning, and so on. I think I have a slide that can also explain this. I, I remove it. Well, we'll we'll see. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll give you some sense uh, later. And why the, all of this is happening now, right? Well, a number of things that that help to do this. First, the big data that there's large data data sets available, right? That allow us to 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 really uh, um, have this uh, availability of information that can be used by the right tools. In that case, like. Uh, this hardware and, and, and CPU, GPUs, uh, TPUs that, that allow us to process this quantity of, of data. But something very interesting that happened simultaneously, especially for the last 10 years, is that most of the work that has been happening in, I would say, computer science has been very much open source. And uh, some of those new techniques, new models have been repurposed, have been reused, and it has really improved the way that uh, this uh, science has evolved because it was uh, very easy to immediately um, immediately uh, built on whatever was built uh, earlier and check it check, check his his uh, its uh, operability right and then keep building on this which creates you know like those uh, large libraries that have been uh, are publicly available and come now imagine combine all of these together and it really creates this this last tenure of explosion right on on AI, right? So that's that's why that that why this is this is relevant. And we've seen this, we've observed in this in different industries. I would say health has been probably uh, the last one, and precisely you know because uh, health, as we'll see, is very much about trust and how you build trust is one of the critical pieces here, right? But eventually, the same way it's been happening for the last uh, for the last few years in certain other industries, it will happen with healthcare. In wealth in healthcare, we're convinced of this. And not just it, it's just that there's no way back. So we believe that it's good to embrace those uh, new technologies and understand how they can better serve us and how they, they can better help our patients. Just give you a, a, an snapshot of what is the what is this uh, context, right? When we talk about machine learning, uh, when we, we start with the very more like statistical models, if you want, like the regressions can be linear, but but we start uh, uh, with this, what we call the supervised learning that where we can uh, label and we can really uh, train a model based on uh, known information, or then move to a more like unsupervised learning where information is not known, we are, it's not labeled, and it's more for the, for the model to train on a, a unknown space compared to what would be a traditional supervised learning and then i can even envision and that has many appliance uh, applications you've seen these in uh, self driving cars and, and and other technologies how the reinforcement learning is also having their own space so i would categorize on those three groups so you get a sense of what this uh, machine learning is about and don't think that machine learning is just like okay i have the model i and there's a plug and play that that's more like complicated we don't get into those details those are just some of the architectures right that are being uh, used and uh, um, just to give you a sense that some of the work that uh, Adam and uh, the researchers that collaborate with us do is uh, is, is really based on, on very uh, solid mathematics. Uh, here I just have some of the ideas because it could be uh, starting with a very simple uh, linear model, but we can complicate it as we want and all with these multi uh, dimensions uh, models, right? Or very uh, complicated technologies that really leverage these mathematics. The idea is not getting into these uh, mathematics. We don't expect people that become like uh, savvy on that space, but yes, get familiar to uh, to what those technologies can do, because this is where we believe we can we can make an impact. And now let's go backwards and, and see big picture. What is this uh, AI in healthcare about, right? What is in the news? Because we've been listening a lot about it. And uh, you can see this in magazines and journals, and, and everybody talks about this, but what, what is this about, right? And uh, the, the reality is that uh, the real adoption of this technology in uh, clinical settings, talking about hospitals, for example, is really limited. We have really, uh, uh, when we try to partner with some of those um, um, healthcare systems, right, we realize that there's some uh, um, I, there's some projects, sometimes people are working, but the adoption is, is limited. Maybe this, this number can, may have increased because this is from a study a couple of years ago, but it's not, uh, it's not on the, on the twofold uh, digit uh, by far. It's, it's still like, uh, it still requires a lot of engagement. I think there's a good uh, opportunity for education and, and trying to democratize the access to these, uh, to these technologies. 
the main barriers, of course, the data access that is always like not just in Europe uh, with some of these regulations, but now in the US, data access is always is always complex, and especially when we talk about health, is something this is very critical. How regulatory issues are going to also facilitate this process, right? Facilitate or or, or the other way, right? So how we really uh, um, help this, but it's kind of like preventing also uh, these these an easy deployment. So, but it's for good. Uh, some of the challenge we experience is, uh, we experience with with in machine learning uh, models, and of course, I, what I was saying about the background and the the some of our physicians, clinicians in general, right, on the on the adoption and the uh, understanding of these of these technologies, right, and for us that resonates very well with what is our mission, right? Our mission as a J Clinic, we are here literally to save lives, and we do it by means of using technology. So for us, the importance of deploying technology, uh, the sooner, the better uh, in, in a robust fashion, right? But with this idea of democratizing, making sure that we have we can access populations with this with this sense of like large scale uh, clinical validation, as uh, Adam was explaining, right? How we can run those models across populations, not just with the current uh, with existing ones, but but being able to to spread across very different populations, and that requires this education, but also policy, right? Those this is something that we're going to be able to influence if we can prove that we're doing a good work with this quality with those uh, with, with with this with those robust models, robust models. And being, bringing together all sorts of players, including, and that, this is usually very important uh, uh, from, from an industry standpoint, how you uh, support these, uh, uh, the, all those entrepreneurship efforts, because usually they really speed up uh, the adoption of these, um, of these technologies. We have our own challenges because you know uh, we would like to, to to create better models with much more uh, reduced data with uh, privacy preserving uh, learning and and again this idea of like uh, being able to create models uh, that are robust uh, across population but even more important here is like how you make uh, models that are explainable right because remember that we're talking about trust and trust especially in this medical space uh, if we're not able to uh, create models that kind of self-explain and explain what what we're doing, it's going to be much more much more challenging for anyone to to adopt, right? So Adam was talking about this idea how we create this network network of hospitals, and we are always open to to collaborations, right? So we have our own uh, internal workflows. We have many. I, I think I have a. Another slide here, yes. Those are most of some of those collaborations that we've been trying to uh, to establish. Right now, is uh, it's uh, much more limited than this, but there's conversations with uh, a number of them uh, across the globe. And for us, this is particularly relevant because this is our opportunity also, uh, not just to validate the, the models, but to give access to uh, uh, the developing and, and, and non-developed countries uh, to access some of these, some of these technologies. We do this also. We do a number of education, but uh, this is the type of work we do uh, on on the from 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 a dissemination of the of the knowledge. But there's a number of uh, of classes that are available, and we encourage people to jump into these, try to understand uh, and and try to adopt these um, these uh, these technologies uh, and understand how how we can how we can better help them. This is a sample of some of the hospitals that. Uh, um, Adam was was mentioning. Uh, today we have expanded, as you see, this is very much a local, very much uh, US driven. But uh, right now we have uh, uh, collaborations in Europe, India, uh, Latin America, and uh, Asia, and other 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 countries, which is like uh, uh, I think very relevant for for these for the for our mission. I'm trying to speed up because I still have few slides, but just to to make uh, some point here on uh, another uh, mission we have also is uh, bringing this community together, researchers here at MIT. And uh, we launched this uh, a couple of years ago, uh, this one of these um, call for proposals, like we found a number of projects. Projects have been founded on uh, application, on different applications of AI, diagnostics, uh, disease monitoring, uh, preventive medicine, and clinical operations at the privacy and drug discovery, as we've been talking. Uh, all this information is available in our uh, website at jclinic.mit.edu and uh, um, I think this this is something that uh, if you are more interested on continual work we also have our uh, social media channels we try to announce we try to uh, organize events and 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 kind of like uh, disseminate this this information to make sure that you know there's a good opportunity for people to to access this and it's not just to the very smart people that work on this but 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 how we bring more people on board to this to this cause yeah 
I, th I think I have more slides on some of the ADA algorithm approval already that have been working, and this idea of who are the stakeholders on the on the healthcare system, and it's a number of them. Uh, but I think maybe Joanna, at this point, we still have a few more minutes just in case we have uh, questions, please. Yes, indeed. Um, excellent. Well, you know, I always love when we have more speak. information. No, absolutely. Um, so we have a question from our registration that I would like to share and uh, could potentially take the rest of our time. Uh, so a first question uh, in three phases. Where do you see the biggest impact of AI and health for the short term, mid term and long term? Okay, that's a, that, that's a very good one. I think when we talk about AI, I think we need to talk about data as well, because we tend to talk about the models, and this is where we, um, where we usually uh, try to excel. But uh, if we want to have this uh, full adoption of, uh, of, of technology, I think we need to do also some, some good work with the, with the data, right? And this is uh, one of the challenges that we always, we always experience. So, mm, I think the 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 way the, I structure this in the initial slide, uh, thinking about like what we call the multi-model uh, uh, model, this is where I think we should go, right? How we can combine all these different uh, data sets, right? And imagine that now we are working with perfect data and we're able to compile all this information in a way that is structured and we can work. Now we're talking about, again, very different different type of signals. It can be vision, it can be electronic health records, tabular uh, data, uh, biospecimens. Imagine that we can, oh, and more important, imagine genetics, which is all this uh, uh, big, big, big animal there, right? Imagine we can combine this. This is where I see the future. And, and that's gonna take some time to get there because there's a number of things that need to align. Meanwhile, and before getting there, there's a number of things that we can start doing. Those models are proving be, uh, are proved to become very efficient, right? And uh, this is what we see with the breast cancer and how it translates to other uh, pathologies. Well, if we start, if we continue doing some of this work, but uh, bringing uh, more of this uh, data and more of these signals, many more people working on this. Imagine a universe where, like, uh, you can really be monitored on a, a permanent time, right? And uh, instead of trying to cure we can be more on the other side, which is like, okay, uh, on the more on the prevention, right? Because we are always on the reactive side, which is like, okay, now we have a problem and how we fix it. But eventually we should move to another stage where like, okay, uh, if it's much more preventive because we already know what are the things that can happen. So we don't get into the disease point, right? Because we're still treating diseases. Maybe we shouldn't be treating diseases and that's the long-term vision. But for now, I think it, can be, it would be a combination, a hybrid on the different models. And I think more important, bringing more people working in this community, that, th that would be very relevant, I think. Excellent. I'm gonna squeeze in one more because I know you are a busy person. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, to end on a note of hope for mankind, uh, how are these technologies being shared in an accessible way to the uh, less fortunate strata of populations of the world? Right. So this is what the, the other issue we encounter, because if, if I go to some places where we don't have images, when we don't have minimal capabilities, when we don't have, you know, the very basic data I can access, it's going to be very difficult for us to, to develop those, those models. Well, maybe we, uh, the way to do it is step by step, right? It's like, okay, try to create those robust models that spread and uh, across populations and then can be uh, deployed in other locations. And for us, especially at Jamil Clinic, it's been a mission, uh, uh, which is like trying to get into uh, those uh, underprivileged uh, populations. Uh, again, it can be in the US because we, we, we have those, those situations, of course, but also in other countries. And try to, to, to join efforts then with uh, local teams, uh, because uh, we're always comparing uh, those, when we compare like to humans, right? It's always try to compare with, with, with a very advanced and privileged uh, clinicians that have access to the best education, but that doesn't happen always necessarily in other places. Well, so how we can bring these people on board, how we can help them. Education, that's why it's it's also very important. And especially today with those with this online access, I think it's it's a way to it's a way to go, yes. Excellent. And what, what we try to do at the MIT. Uh, so it's a, it's our flagship here. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so, so much, Ignacio, for your time and all your brilliant insights. We very much appreciated having you. And uh, it is one o'clock on the dot. So uh, just, yes, thank you incredibly much. Um, and uh, to, 
Yes, absolutely. And uh, I would also like to say thank you to all of our uh, attendees. We would love to thank you for coming. I personally would also like to thank my Swiss Next team members, uh, James Moore, Jonas Brunschweig, and Benjamin Bowman for making this happen. Last but not least, we would very much encourage you to sign up for the subsequent events for the AI and Healthcare Equity Conference. The link is in the chat. Um, yes, and thank you very much to, again, Adam Yala and Ignacia Fuentes Ribas, as well as our partners, the Canton de Vaud and Esad. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day.